good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you, Mr. Perez and Deputy Secretary Graves, for joining us. We're, we're honored to have you here today and to celebrate bringing broadband to our little corner of rural America. And it is, uh, it is very rural. One of the things that occurred to me as we were touring our system operations center is if you're a if you're a customer in Milwaukee, you'll have a utility that has hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of customers per mile of line. Some of our areas have six or four. And, uh, and bringing broadband to those communities is just that much more difficult. I do also want to recognize our board of directors and our member CEOs that are here today. Thank you. We've got a great turnout in that area. And, and the reason we're here today is to discuss, celebrate, and learn from uh, this nearly $15 million grant we received um, just earlier this year. And what's important about that grant for us is it's serving 250,000 customers in, in really rural uh, communities that have equity challenges, economic challenges, and spread throughout three states, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. We also represented today by our Illinois member as well, and so we serve four states. And we made, we made a very conscious decision to, uh, to build this infrastructure in these particular areas. They're, they're particularly underserved in a lot of ways and disadvantaged communities, and what, what was surprising to a lot of us as we submitted this, that um, each of these counties have average household incomes below the national average. And people forget that about rural America. We're over 90% of, of persistent poverty exists in rural America. And, and when we think about a project like this, it is going to accelerate projects that would have probably been done eventually, but I think much, much too late. And it brings equity, education, and, and, and as important as those, economic growth. And so I, I do want to acknowledge uh, Kim Hagelson. Raise, raise your hand, please. Uh, she was the leader of this uh, grant effort with a great team behind her. But I, I wanted to share with the group the day that we received notice that we were successful in this grant, Kim and some of her team members came into our boardroom, in the middle of the boardroom, and if I could, if I could bottle that happiness and joy, I, I could, I, I wouldn't have to work here anymore. Sorry, board. <laughs> but thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for this opportunity to grow our system in a way that's so important. And so, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Deputy Secretary Don Graves. Well, can you hear me? There we go. Fred, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, that great introduction and laying the groundwork. Uh, so I don't have to say anything really. Um, but it is really great to be with you all today. Uh, it's a great excuse for me to get back home to the Midwest. Uh, I miss the Midwest, uh, spending a lot of time in, in DC these days. Um, I want to thank my good friend, uh, Secretary Tom Perez uh, for being here with me to really bring attention to what I think is a critical issue and a critical opportunity uh, for our country. Um, we took a tour of this facility, it's a fantastic facility. We know that not only is, as Brent said, is the challenge of rural areas not just about, uh, about access, it's about uh, delivering for communities so that we can uh, we can deal with challenge with issues like persistent poverty. Um, one of the things that the president said early on to all of us uh, in the administration was, "We're not representing certain people or certain parts of the country. We're representing all parts of the country." And this uh, our opportunity to invest in all of America is about making sure that communities, whether it's rural areas or underserved urban areas, that we're actually delivering so that people not only uh, uh, have access to, uh, to high-speed internet, but they have access to opportunities. What high-speed internet does is it delivers lives of dignity. That's what this is all about. If we aren't providing opportunities for people to be able to sell over uh, the internet, access uh, healthcare resources, be able to, uh, to communicate, uh, then we're not gonna, they're not gonna be able to be successful 
families. It's not, it's one thing to be able, as a small business owner, former small business owner myself, it's one thing to sell down the street. But if you're in a community where there's only 10 other folks to sell to, you're not gonna get very far with your business. But if you have high-speed internet, you can sell to the entire world. And the United States has some of the best, most creative, innovative people, products, and companies in the world. So let's make it easier for them to be able to sell to the rest of the world. We're so excited, Brent, about this grant um, and Kim, fantastic job with your application. That's why, uh, why it was a winner. Um, what this is gonna do is using Dairyland and it's really this cooperative approach. It's, it's about building a community, delivering uh, high-speed internet by using a, an existing system that, where you're already delivering capacity to communities. So we were really excited about the grant effectively retrofitting nearly 250 miles of fiber over the course of three years. That's pretty quick for delivering, uh, delivering fiber optic uh, to communities all across the region, connecting south, southeast Wisconsin to other major networks uh, across the region. In areas like this where industries such as agriculture and tourism and all the small businesses that that are uh, and medium-sized businesses that are in the region, their destiny, uh, the individual destiny of those companies is the destiny uh, and uh, potentially the economic prosperity of the entire region. So it's critically important that we deliver high-speed internet to the entire community. The truth is that you all can't compete without it. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with too many uh, stats. The great thing is the bipartisan infrastructure law is allowing us to connect every family, every household, every street in the United States for the first time to high-speed internet. Um, Forty-five billion dollars to make sure that we have affordable, reliable, high-speed internet uh, everywhere. So Wisconsin, uh, in addition to the, the, the funding that we're providing for this uh, middle mile uh, program, we're also providing a billion dollars to Wisconsin uh, for funding for the last mile connectivity, for uh, connecting tribal communities, connecting uh, uh, folks, again, to telehealth, to distance learning, to affordable uh, and uh, digital inclusion initiatives. With that, I've talked too much. Um, I would rather listen to the rest of the group, but. Before I do that, let me turn it over to uh, a great friend, a great ally, a great partner, and someone who has been talking about, uh, about workers, talking about communities, talking about uh, inclusion and access for his entire career, my friend, Secretary Tom Perez. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, you know, I used to coach basketball for 15 years and I'd watch people play and I'd say, uh, you know, watch that person, he's got game. Don's got game. <laughs> and uh, we're both Midwesterners. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. He grew up in the uh, Cleveland area. And uh, my wife is from Milwaukee and we got married there and we spent a lot of time up in Marinette County. So it's always wonderful to uh, be back in the Midwest, as Don correctly said. Uh, Brent, thank you for your leadership. Thank you to everyone on your team. Uh, you know, you, you said the following word more than once in your brief and really cogent opening remarks, and that is the word equity. Uh, early on in the president's tenure, when we knew that we were in a world of hurt because of this pandemic, but if you look at our nation's history, moments of greatest crisis have also been moments of remarkable opportunity. You know, when I was your labor secretary, most of the laws we enforced were a product of the New Deal. And I had the privilege of leading the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department during the first term of President Obama. And most of the laws we enforced were a product of the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. This is another one of these moments now. And, and one of the most important things we want to communicate is that we need to meet the moment. And that's exactly what you did in this grant meeting the moment, making sure that we can do this. 
Um, I was really excited that one of our speakers, one of our panelists is Kim, who operates a fairly qualified um, health clinic. You know, when I think of health care, there's, there's, it's a three-legged stool, access, quality, cost. It's the same thing in this context. Broadband is no different than water, electricity, and health care. They are a fundamental right that every community should enjoy, and we should be doing our level best to make sure that there's access to quality, accessible broadband. I, we have, uh, in Western Maryland, I live in Maryland, in Western Maryland, the westernmost county, has one psychiatrist. We have a mental health crisis in this country. And what we learned during the pandemic was telemedicine was essential in communities to deliver health care. Problem is, you know, here in Wisconsin, for instance, um, roughly 11% of households and businesses lacked basic internet service, and another 20% lacked high-speed internet. And so that cohort was out of luck. And that's why the fundamental value proposition for the president is equity, making sure that tribal communities have access. And I appreciate the presence of the Ho-Chunk Nation here. Making sure that rural communities have access. As you correctly point out, when, what did people do during this pandemic? You know, the, the Amazons of the world were going gangbusters. But we want to make sure that the small rural business owner, I was reading about one who has a, a special um, fishing pole that they were selling out of their home. Uh, you know, right here in the La Crosse area. It's kind of hard to do it. Yeah, thank you. I was reading about you on the way here. <laughs> and, you know, I got to believe it's a little hard to do if you're on no internet or low speed internet. It's hard to go to scale. So that's what this is all about. It's about equity, access, opportunity, quality. And just remember, this is one of the, this is a moment in time that we will not see, I think, against, again in our lifetimes. A moment of tremendous opportunity because the president has said in every zip code, in every corner of this country, we want access to broadband so that people can have access to their livelihoods. That's what it's all about. And that's why I want to thank you. I love the co-op model as well. Um, I have a real affection uh, for that. So uh, coming here and seeing what you're doing. Thank you to your workers. Uh, your workforce is your backbone. And uh, I want to say thank you to all of you who are uh, toiling away. And I, you know, my brother got 77 inches of snow in 30 hours in Buffalo last year. Uh, and um, I know you all in situations like that are working your tails off to save lives, quite literally. So thank you for what you do day in and day out. And we will turn it back to you, Doc. Okay. Well, this is really meant to be a conversation. Um, so I know this is not a shy group. Um, uh, so feel free to jump in uh, at any point. Um, we've talked a little bit about the Healthcare issues and the challenges of, uh, of access to uh, to education and training. I wonder if you all could uh, start by talking about um, what high-speed internet does to for uh, rural communities uh, that's maybe different uh, than more urban areas in this country. So I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Kim. Sure. Is this on? Um, well, you stole my thunder just a little bit about m behavioral health care. Um, and thank you so much for being here and uh, recognizing the value of federally qualified health centers. Uh, just a tidbit, one in 11 Americans are served by health centers. Uh, we are fortunate in this region to have tremendous health care access. However, there is still need for health center services, and uh, we are fortunate that we have a really strong health center that's been serving this region for 30 years. And um, the example that I'd like to share is related to behavioral health. And I'd like to start with a concept called rural informed care. Uh, there's a lot of conversations around uh, poverty informed care and other things, but really what we're talking about today is being rurally informed in all of the facets that all of 
us are talking about. And um, I'd like to share a story about success in rural healthcare related to telemedicine and maybe some barriers. First is um, behavioral healthcare, a story that an individual shared uh, publicly actually at a conference I was at in Chicago uh, was a high performing, high profile uh, professional who uh, at about 50 years old was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And uh, the long and the short is um, in her depressive states was unable to seek care, did not want to go to dinner with her lifelong soulmate, did not want to have lunch with her best friend uh, since high school, and as she stated, the very least thing I wanted to do was to get dressed, drive 30 minutes through traffic, or 30 minutes on country roads, if you want to use the rural example, to go see someone who really I didn't know very well and talk about how depressed I was. Her response was, telemedicine was a game changer for me and my recovery from my depression. When I was in my depressive states, I made every one of my behavioral health appointments. It was a game changer. We're seeing more telemedicine appointments in behavioral health than we are in any other health care discipline. Telemedicine in behavioral health has been a game changer. We know we have a behavioral health crisis. Scenic Bluffs is doing telemedicine in school districts with kids. We have behavioral health providers in eight school districts, and we're doing behavioral health with kids in school districts. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to expand that. The other areas that it has happened in is stroke. Uh, there are a number of healthcare <laughs> providers that are doing telestroke. There are a number of diabetics that are improving their outcomes and improving their care with specialty consults just by doing an appointment from their couch with their specialist or their primary care provider and checking in on their diabetes. So telemedicine has improved outcomes and improved care. Time is brain when you talk about stroke care and a number of providers in this community have really made a difference in rural medicine because the outcomes for people in rural communities were different before the telestroke program. So truly, broadband has made a difference for those people in rural communities. Now barriers, we also have examples, and I have shared, um, have our providers have shared a couple of stories where we have a mom, uh, two small children, single mom, two small children, her behavioral health appointments, she can only do them using her cellular data. It uses all of her monthly data, and her data is not necessarily reliable. Their video appointments, so her connectivity drops frequently. It's a really disruptive appointment. She sometimes can go to the library and do it. Maybe it's private enough, but usually not. Um, so it's really difficult for her to get access to her behavioral health services or any other health services that she might want to do. So there is a challenge when there isn't reliable connectivity and or um, other patients that I, I surveyed our providers before this meeting. We have a lot of providers that have broadband access, but they have old equipment or old routers, those types of things, and they don't necessarily know that the two don't go together. And so they have the same problem. They have poor connectivity, um, unreliable service, and they drop connectivity, so they just let it go, and then they don't access. I'm going to stop talking, but weather is also an issue in our area. <laughs> Another reason for strong broadband connectivity. So, thanks so much, Kim. Uh, I'll turn maybe to, to Charlotte, and and I should have said this. If you could also introduce yourselves and uh, or what your what organization or institution you're representing. Same question. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Charlotte Peters. I am with the UW Madison Division of Extension. I'm the community development educator for La Crosse County. Um, I have been involved with broadband issues for La Crosse County for almost a year now in looking at 
where we stand as a county and what could we do or what can we do or what needs to be done. Um, recently, La Crosse County completed a survey where every single resident um, and businesses too, but I'm gonna speak mainly to the residential portion of it, um, received in the mail a survey to gauge what the needs were for the community um, as far as broadband service or connectivity issues go. Um, generally, when you do a survey like this, you're lucky to get three to five percent um, of it of feedback. We actually got a little over seven percent of the county to respond to this survey. So we have a lot of really excellent data on that. Um, in speaking to the telehealth uh, issue, we have a little over 23,000 seniors in this community, um, and telehealth for them is indispensable. I know as a care provider for my uh, father, being able to log in and do a telehealth, just a quick question or things like that, saves me time away from work, saves me time away from family, and gets me the help that I need for him almost instantly. Um, being able to have our seniors log in and just ask simple questions and take care of their diabetic needs or other services like that is indispensable to them. The, the northeast to the basically the southeast section of this county is desperately underserved as far as connectivity goes. Not only do we run into the problem of there, it's so rural um, that ISPs in the past have been unwilling to put services into that area, but there are also geographical limitations and barriers that we need to address. Um, a lot of these programs for getting connectivity going are great, but they don't really address the actual cost that very rural communities are facing as far as what it really literally costs to put in a mile for service. You know, and we live in one of the most unique places in the world. We live in the driftless zone. That in itself is an issue for this type of service. You know, so um, there are so many opportunities out there and so many people, you know, that that seven percent of people that are that are willing to to mail in surveys because we had so many mailed in because they just don't have the connectivity. Those are the stories that we hear on the regular, you know, from, from our community members is, I'd love to be able to do this, but I don't have internet. I'd love to be able to participate in this, but I don't have internet. You know, our school, um, rural school districts, Melrose Mindoro has um, almost 12% of their students don't have access. And it's not even an affordability issue. 83% of those people that don't have it, don't have it because they just don't have service. There is no service there for them to so I think that's, you know, coming from the rural area, it, it is very different than the metro areas. And there are, there are a ton of unserved and underserved people in these areas too, based on income and other things. But the rural communities are really at a disadvantage just because there is no service. Thanks for that, Charlotte. And, and you know, I, I know Tom and I both uh, have, through the pandemic and coming out, talked to parents who, uh, uh, we're basically saying, what do we do? We went remote, but I only have enough connectivity. If I have connectivity for one of my kids, the bandwidth is, is too low. I can only get one of my four kids to school that day. So how do I choose who gets to go to school? That's, that's an issue. You know, thankfully, in some communities, and I'm gonna to turn to you next, Chris, um, there were great institutions like the library that where kids, families uh, could go, and even if it was just sitting out in the parking lot, to be able to do homework, to access telehealth, to apply for new jobs, to uh, get services. What's been your experience or the library's experience and how will this change how you offer service and what you can do. Again, I'm Chris McCarroll Rojo. I'm with the La Crosse County Library. We operate the facilities outside the city of La Crosse in Bangor, town of Campbell, Holman, Alaska, and West Salem. And probably the, the one item I'll point out first is not even all five of our locations have high speed internet right now. We still have a couple of them on DSL because of um, what is available. So the pandemic had a huge impact on us with especially the, 
our young people. The school district did a fabulous job getting devices in people's hands, but then the connectivity was, was just insurmountable for some people. We would have, and, and initially when the pandemic first hit, our doors were actually closed to the public. We did what we could to, to change that very quickly. We were one of the libraries that uh, opened the fastest when we could um, with some you know, per capita limits of people and distancing uh, per DPI. But we pushed for that because we had children sitting on our benches outside of our building trying to download their homework for the day. And um, it was just a, a critically sad time. A again, the districts did fabulous work. Um, they started uh, with meal deliveries. They would have hot spots on the buses, and they would use some of our parking lots to, to try to enhance it. Um, Mr. Graves talked about dignity, and I think that this is going to be one of the most critical things that this um, helps when you talk about telemedicine, Kim mentioned that sometimes they can come to the library and sometimes they do, but can you imagine sitting in this kind of proximity to someone and trying to discuss your medical situation, um, your banking needs, um, trying to do those remotely? Kim also talked about, yeah, it, it's kind of remarkable how many people have cell phones in their hands now, but a good portion of those are on limited data plans or prepaid plans. They don't want to waste their cellular data on, on things that we take for granted. And so they come into our locations to try to connect to the wireless, to try to find a corner where they can do their banking or you know discuss something with a student uh, school counselor or that tel telemedicine aspect. Um, I think that this will just make an incredible impact and I know some people say, well, this is going to take your role away. And it absolutely will not. There is a significant digital literacy issue in this country. So even if we can get this connectivity to these homes, we can step in then with that role of how do you use that connectivity? How do you access your medical records? It's the only way you can do it now is through the portal. And so we have people that come in every day okay, here's my username and password. It's just that confidentiality and dignity piece. If we can help people to be able to do that in their own homes rather than having to do it in an unprotected, unconfidential environment, it would be, would be amazing. Uh, Jenny, I shouted you out at the outset because I was intrigued by your I mean, you have a wonderful job, your day job. So let's stipulate to that, okay, Brad? I, so, so we're gonna stipulate to that. But uh, you and your husband, I believe, uh, have uh, uh, another business on the side. I'd love to learn more about it. I'd love to hear from you about how the pandemic impacted your ability and, and what would be different if you had access, regular access, to high-speed internet. Sure, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just Jenny Radcliffe, Economic Development Manager here at Dairyland. Uh, before I start, I um, was part of that team that received the NTI middle mile, and, and I just wanna echo my thanks and excitement. I actually happen to be up north on vacation at a bowling alley, uh, and the team FaceTimed me as we went into the boardroom to, to give the good news, and uh, it, was, it was a pretty amazing moment, so, so thank you. And um, so, uh, yeah, about four and a half years ago, um, my husband and I had an opportunity to buy a, a rural property uh, in the hometown where I grew up, uh, 25 miles away from my parents was too far once I had a child. I needed to be close to grandma and grandpa. Uh, so we had this opportunity and uh, we, we were ready to, to, to um, jump in. Our only issue was, was connectivity. We knew that it had uh, basically next to no um, cell phone coverage and we knew that the best wired internet that we could get was a, a three, an advertiser, I should say, 3-1 uh, wired connection. So, um, but we were Midwestern farm kids and we said, well, we'll figure it out. 
Um, so we, we signed up for a, a, a satellite internet provider, um, which you know was expensive, but luckily I do have a wonderful job and, and we could make that happen. Um, and all was well until you know the first storm hit and uh, the, the satellite went out and, and you don't have access to anything. Um, and then pretty soon you hit the data cap and you still have, uh, you know, 18 days of the month left. And, and uh, when you have to tell your four-year-old what that spinning thing on the TV is, um, you know, that's, that's not very good either. Um, but, you know, those were, those were trivial. You know, we, we kind of got through those. Um, you know, uh, as uh, my husband's small business started to grow, um, so just an aside, my husband uh, has a small side hustle. It's called Radcliffe Custom Rods. He makes um, high quality custom fishing rods, both for ice fishing and, and summer fishing. Uh, sells them mostly in the Midwest here, but, but across the nation. Um, yeah, we, we started to realize what the, some of the real challenges were, um, you know, with, uh, with the business, things like just being able to upload photos to the website it would take forever. and then it would time out and you'd get frustrated and you're like, oh, we'll deal with this tomorrow. Um, you know, we, we would be going to my parents' house to be able to do things like that. Um, even being able to make uh, simple phone calls to customers, you'd be in the middle of a phone call and get disconnected. Um, you know, have to try to go out and stand in the middle of the driveway with your hand like this to try to <laughs> make the connectivity work. Um, so we experienced a lot of that uh, COVID hit, and then of course we both came home and we're both working full-time jobs for, uh, from home and really realized what the challenges were. Um, at that point, we did add that advertised 3-1 wired connection, so at least we had two options uh, and could kind of bounce back and forth. When one kicked us off, we'd pop on the other one. Um, but there were many times when we would drive, you know, two miles down the road um, to, to where we knew we had cell coverage to be able to hop on a hotspot and take a call, um, you know, whenever I would have board meetings or, uh, you know, a meeting I would have to chair. Uh, I'd go to my parents, sit at their kitchen table to be able to have decent connectivity so that, um, you know, things weren't, weren't like they were. Um, one of our managers called me after a meeting one time and said, is your internet really that terrible? You look, you look awful. I said, yeah, it is, it is. Um, so luckily, uh, we, um, so, so we've definitely experienced uh, our fair share of challenges. Um, luckily, we were able to get Vice, or I'm sorry, uh, Starlink a couple of, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, and we feel very fortunate that obviously not, not you know, as good as fiber, but it's a step in the right direction. We feel very fortunate that we were able to do that. It's not an option for most people in rural America. It's cost prohibitive, um, both from an upfront um, cost perspective as well as the ongoing, um, ongoing costs. Um, I would be remiss if I don't give a shout out to Vernon Communications Co-op and um, Garen is the new CEO there and he doesn't know it yet but he's going to be my new BFF in about, in about six months. Um, they did receive a uh, Wisconsin uh, broadband expansion grant and they're going to be coming down our road uh, sometime next year. So um, for me that will be like the day that electricity was delivered to the family farm 85 years ago. So um, you can be sure I will be there with the camera and uh, it, it will be a celebration. Yeah, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for that question. I, I want to make sure we give everyone a, a chance uh, moving forward here. And uh, uh, Mia, I wanted to turn to you because uh, um, you know one issue that has been a challenge in so many areas, whether it's healthcare delivery, whether it's broadband, whether it's other critical services, is that uh, we as a nation have underperformed in uh, addressing access to opportunity in tribal communities. That's not an issue unique to Wisconsin, it's an issue across the country. And as you think about you know, the, the, the Ho-Chunk Nation and uh, you know, the, the, the remarkably, um, in, in, incredibly you know, diverse and um, entrepreneurial spirit, and then you think about Gen Zers, uh, you know, what, what is the importance of making sure you have access to um, accessible, quality, affordable broadband in, in your nation? Um, so I'm Mia Falcon. Uh, I go to school at Black River Falls High School and I'm a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, and you're doing great. <laughs> um, I think that uh, during COVID, um, I have four other sisters and we would all be online 
and um, some like sometimes there'd be like on, we wouldn't be able to get on. So, <laughs> but um, I think that like. Uh, what would you do if, you, if one of you couldn't get on? Um, we'd have to call our mom and ask her to help us or like to see if like if it was the Wi-Fi or if it was us. I don't know, but... Um. Were there times where you couldn't do your homework because you simply couldn't get on? Yeah, there were some days where I'd have to like email my teachers and just be like, I can't get on like right now. I can't be in class right now. And I'd have them like send me the the assignment that we did, but it sometimes be hard because I wasn't there listening during the lesson, and um, so yeah, it'd be it'd be hard to do the assignment, but eventually I'd get it done. But yeah, um, I think that. Uh, You're doing great. <laughs> I mean, the the the, the data. The story you just said is borne out across the country in the data. And one of the impacts of the combination of the pandemic and broadband gaps is the level of learning loss across the country has been frightening. And the level of learning loss in communities uh, that have historically been underserved is even more unconscionable. And, and that is why this is not simply an educational imperative, it's frankly a moral imperative. And that's what I heard you say, because you shouldn't have to draw straws to figure out who's gonna be able to go to school today. And I have a feeling that's basically what you did. Thank you for being here. Can we give it up for her, by the way? <laughs> Switching gears just a little bit, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, on weekends going out uh, visiting my grandmother, uh, and she lived in farm country, and I would go and help out on the farms next door, uh, and uh, you know, occasionally bringing in the harvest and uh, doing whatever I could. Um, a lot of people uh, think of farms, when they think about it, they think about farms the way that farms operated 7,500 years ago. Um, but I was just at the, the port in Milwaukee uh, and uh, yesterday, and we were talking to farmers who are working directly with the port, trying to get their product out. They're thinking about global distribution. They're thinking about uh, the type of data access that they need. Maybe they're using NOAA and our National Weather Service at the Commerce Department to make determinations on when they're gonna plant or when they're gonna uh, harvest. What does high-speed internet access, quality, affordable, reliable high-speed internet access do for, for farmers, Darren? Thank you, Don. Uh, Darren Mender, uh, president of the Wisconsin Farm Regime and, and a third-generation organic dairy farm from just down the road from Jenny. We, actually have the same high school alma mater, so a small world there. But uh, it, it, night and day, um, you know, because if you can't get that information today, you're two weeks behind schedule on most things. And, and with, you know, every farm is a business, so those farms that don't have that capability um, really struggle. Um, I happen to live in the Ver Vernon Communications Network, which is a cooperative, and I love co-ops because I get things done. And getting that internet access, uh, we've, we've had it for um, 14, 15 years already because the Vernon Communications uh, Board said we're gonna go and get it done. And we had wire for a while, now we have fi uh, fiber optics, so you know, very rarely get cut off on anything. Um, during our board meetings, our members from the northern part of the state most time have to call in. Um, if they're lucky enough to have good internet, they can be with us for half an hour sometimes maybe. Uh, video-wise, but uh, you know, just getting your your wares from the farm out. So, over the past 10 years, a lot of our members um, that have joined have been uh, community-supported agriculture folks. So, CSAs, and they like to talk to their customers on a on a regular basis, meaning probably every day if they can, especially during harvest season, summertime. 
and that allows them to get that word out and, and talk to their customers. But we also have a lot of those members that don't have that good access, especially you know, if you go from line from here over to Green Bay and north of that throughout the state, um, really struggle within most rural areas. And so, uh, you know, having cooperatives, the way the cooperatives electrified the country back in the 40s, let's, let's do that with this process. And, you know, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, thank you to uh, Secretary Perez and thank you to the Biden administration for really putting these dollars out there and allowing communities to um, get uh, fiber optic cable and getting that internet service, service because it does allow us to connect with the rest of the world. Thank you for being such a great uh, spokesperson for farmers. Way too many people don't think about impact on farmers and Joe Biden does and Tom Vilsack does and Don Graves does. Um, and one other thing Joe Biden says, when we talk about the infrastructure bill, when we talk about the American Rescue Plan, when we talk about, uh, he was in Colorado yesterday at the world's largest manufacturer of um, stanchions for, for wind. Um, when you think about all of these investments, he thinks about it through the lens of jobs. And Nick, you know a little bit about jobs. You know a little bit about unions, and uh, I'd love to get your perspective on how not, not only broadband, but some of the other uh, things that we're working on, whether it's um, offshore wind, uh, you know, other investments that are really helping the grid. Our, our tour today, when we were looking at your uh, your uh, board, yeah, the jumbotron. I mean, what was most notable to me was the multiple sources of solar and wind that are powering the tri-state region, actually the four-state region and in Illinois. I don't want to forget Illinois. So Nick, um, talk about what this has meant to the IBEW. We can talk about this all day, but one, first I want to thank Brent and the board uh, for having all of us up here today, and thank you to you both uh, for coming up. It means the world to us to have you guys up here. But uh, my name is Nick Weber, I'm the director of member membership development here at the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 953. We have about 2,000 members that are based here in western Wisconsin, um, Darlin Power employees, rural electric co-ops, investor-owned utilities, and a lot of our members and a growing amount of our members are coming from our construction contractors. With this influx of infrastructure money that's coming to our area, we have grown our local union by almost 30% in the past three years. We have a ton of work um, coming up here, and this is why we're so excited about this. I wanna share a couple of, uh, of stories here of what I've seen just personally, you know, in my five years here at the Union Hall. My first um, story was about four years ago, and I was just kind of twiddling away uh, down at the Union Hall, you know, slow, cold day, and um, there was two gentlemen that came into the Union Hall I had never met before. And they came in, they said, hey, we, you know, we're working at this factory right now, we don't really, you know, want to keep doing the third shift at the factory anymore, we don't see a way out of here. And we were both driving home and saw some folks on the side of the road putting in fiber, we want to do that. I said, well, that's great. I'm looking for two people right now, right? And starting, and, you know, and starting on that, and that, uh, you know, real basic level of construction um, in this, in the years that they have been, you know, in this industry, they are now running their own crews, right? And uh, learning how to run the directional drill and all those cool pieces of equipment. Um, but you know, we we stayed in, in very close contact, and they said that we, you know, we bought a house, we got married, we're you know, putting money away. You know, one of them's, you know, expecting a child here pretty soon, and they said, I, w I wouldn't have seen myself doing that here if we had not made that change, right? Um, so there's a ton of stories just about that, and those are, those are the ones here, you got bad days, but you got days like that that'll carry you on for another six months. Um, the second one, uh, second story here, was just this past year, uh, where a longtime uh, member of ours uh, running uh, a directional drill was actually able to provide service to his own house, which is about as good as it gets uh, for uh, anybody in this industry, having the kids be able to watch, you know, dad put in uh, 
fiber internet to his own house. So it's little stories like that. Um, but it, in reality here, we're not only bridging you know, the digital divide here, which is so, so needed here. I'm from north of Highway 8 um, here in Wisconsin. It was, it was tough growing up, right? Um, and we just didn't have it, right? And, uh, but you know, we're creating family supporting jobs here. We're, we're changing lives. And those, those small stories here, we can look at you know, these billion dollar figures. We're looking at 15 you know, million dollar figures here, and that's fantastic. But what we're really doing here you know, in the meantime, as we're changing lives in so many ways, being able to access, you know, the outside world from our little corner of it, and being able to provide, you know, family supporting jobs to, at times, some economically depressed areas, you know, our neighbors, right? So it's been a great experience, and, and, and Tom, thank you so much for, I'm gonna steal the meet the moment, because we have been waiting for this moment um, for a long time with our um, industry partners, our contractors, I'm talking about training opportunities um, and being able to meet this moment, and we're we're excited to be a part of that. So, Nick, thanks so much for that. Uh, it shows the power of what uh, these types of investments, these types of commitments, can do to changing people's lives. Um, uh, the, the president, or or as he likes uh, to be called, Joe. Uh, Joe knows that uh, that the, the the brotherhood has always had his back, and. Uh, what he says all the time is, I'll always have their back in the back of, of American workers. So thank you for what uh, you and the, and the Brotherhood do every day. Um, I'm going to finish up with, with Nate. Uh, you're going to close this out here. Um, no pressure. No pressure, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'd prefer if we were uh, uh, having uh, this conversation over, over a bowl of nefla soup. Uh, yeah, you betcha in, uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota. My wife is from North Dakota, Bismarck. Um, in order for us to deal with all the challenges and create more opportunities for millions of Americans every day, we need you and your team working together with the Dairyland team what is this going to mean for you, and 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 how are you guys going to deliver? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Nate Besher, uh, Pierce Pepin Cooperative Services, uh, based in Ellsworth, Wisconsin, and, and I echo Nick. I uh, want to say thank you for being here and uh, bringing the spotlight to uh, Wisconsin. Also, thank you to, to Dairyland for hosting uh, this really great event. I, I, I hold a little bit of the same affinity uh, with you, Secretary, on uh, coaching basketball. Uh, building broadband easy, coaching first and second grade basketball, a little, little, more, a little more challenging. We were, Kim and I were talking about that before we got started. But um, we, we have a saying at uh, Pierce Pepin, uh, fiber fixes everything. And, you know, it's something that, that we didn't, uh, I didn't coin, it was there uh, a number of years uh, before I got there. It was really a challenge that uh, we were trying to solve uh, early, early on. And, and the big limitation that we had was, was really funding, um, because we are building into uh, rural areas. And, and we're a success story. Uh, we are an electric cooperative that got into uh, delivering uh, retail broadband services. And over the past two years, we've built 800 miles of fiber, and we've passed 6,000 homes along the way. And those are 6,000 people that did not have connectivity uh, prior uh, to, to us doing that, and certainly did not have that during uh, the pandemic. Um, you've heard it from, from some of the other panelists here. Uh, this is really our 1930s challenge of, of today. Uh, it's getting rural folks connected um, with really an essential service, and, and we're, we're so proud to, to do that. Um, when I started um, there uh, at Pierce Pepin in, in 2019, uh, we, we, we went around our community and said, what are the biggest needs we have here? What, what can we do to, to help? Uh, two things came out of those conversations, affordable housing and reliable broadband. And everyone told us, we will not have affordable housing if we do not have connectivity. It's that important. And so we started down this path of, of trying to solve uh, that dilemma. Um, we were seeing businesses leave our community because they did not have connectivity. And even from the electric side, that's a loss of load and, and that, that hurts our, our member base when that happens. And then my favorite story, I've, I've told a few of uh, the people here this already today, but um, we had people that were, uh, during the pandemic, working from home. But because they didn't have connectivity, what working from home meant is that they were leasing office space 
in larger communities commuting to those spaces, spending their salary on spaces so that they could work from home just to have a great job. And, and really being able to deliver uh, broadband service has been a real game changer uh, in that. We're really happy with the, the partnership with Dairyland. Um, we're excited about uh, the middle mile connectivity that they're going to provide. Um, we've, all, we've already had some great conversations with uh, the staff down to Joe Carroll about how can we make this broader middle mile network um, that, that can get us into some of these big data centers uh, in Chicago, in Minneapolis, and, and the likes. And so um, this is just, just the start of, of something that we think is going to be a really, really big deal. It has already been a big deal uh, in our community. And uh, we're so excited to be a part of the solution uh, to, to this problem. Thanks so much, Nate, for that. Well, you all, I think, are getting a flavor of uh, what we hope will be a game changer uh, to communities all across this region and across the country. Um, we talk a lot about uh, big numbers, you know, this many billions or trillions of dollars. At the end of the day, what we're really talking about is people's lives. Um, it, we can't forget about how this can be a game changer for individual uh, people, for uh, a worker who wants to, uh, to take a different approach, try a different industry so that they can have a, a life-changing job that will support a family and will allow them to buy a home uh, and uh, raise that family uh, and uh, and send, them, send their kids off to school with that state stability that they need. Uh, it's the access that a senior needs to telehealth services so that, uh, so that they can stay healthy and live to see their, uh, their daughter's wedding. Uh, it's the, the support that, uh, that our library system uh, can provide that they can't do without this high-speed internet or that our educational system is able to deliver to, uh, to people like Mia who just want to learn so that they can have a bright future ahead of them. So much more that we could talk about. Um, We're going to keep pushing on delivering on the bipartisan infrastructure law, delivering these billions of dollars so that we can provide lives of dignity to so many uh, millions of Americans. But before we close out, I'm going to turn it over to my friend uh, Tom, to finish things up. I just asked Mia to give a note to her mother. I just wrote, Dear Mia's mom, she did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great mom. You know how to raise kids. Uh, it's inspiring to be here, to see the collaborative spirit here, to understand the intersectionality of all this, health care, uh, job creation, um, equity, access to opportunity, uh, this is what it's all about. Um, it's easy to get a little downcast when you sometimes look at the noise that emanates. But you know what Joe Biden wants to do day in and day out. And I want to I want to finish where Don started, um, which is this isn't about red and blue. It's not about urban and rural. It's about making sure zip code never determines destiny. That's what it's all about, and that's what this investment's about. That's what this partnership is about. And I mean, you, everybody here was just so eloquent in giving a different dimension to the same challenge. I know we can meet this challenge. And I, I think you said it, Nate, at the end. This, this is our 1930s moment, you know, and, and we have to meet this moment because you never want to wake up X years down the road and realize that the moment has passed you by. Um, we want to come back here in the not so distant future and see that, you know, we've basically eliminated the broadband gaps, that we've made real progress, that your business is booming. You know, and I want to go to your IPO, okay? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's really what we want to do. And I'm confident that we can do it. Uh, time is of the essence because too many people are being left behind right now. But thanks to these investments, not only this $15 million grant, but you know the over $1 billion that has been invested in Wisconsin, um, equal amounts uh, in other states in this region, uh, this is what the future is about.
Let's seize that moment. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. I feel like we should give you the last word because this is your place. I, I would just reiterate uh, my thanks to both of you and your teams for setting this up and spending so much time with us today. Uh, we shared uh, the change this would bring to us and the excitement in the organization. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and one more round of applause for the entire panel.